welcome to you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm John Watkins. And we're just going to do a little summary of the, the, the financial results of the previous year. Um, I'll, I'll talk about some stuff and then James will go through the numbers. We're going to talk about the market and the opportunity for us. And we're going to talk a little bit about our acquisitions that we've made in the last, uh, last financial year. And we've got some demonstrations and we'll try and move it along a bit so it's not too, uh, too boring. You don't hear too much from me. So the highlights of, of the last 12 months, we had, a, we had a pretty good year. As you can see, we had strong organic growth supplemented by acquisitions. So we, we grew overall by 44%. Um, our recurring revenue, which is the bedrock of our business, the, you know, the, the money we get from our subscriptions, went up 50%. Our profit doubled as a result, and our cash generation was very strong. And uh, it was sufficiently good for us to believe that we could um, propose a dividend, which Julie got approved 20 minutes ago. And I think the operating profit bridge is quite interesting because what it shows is that actually the base business, Trackmate and Box as it was before the acquisitions, actually made a very strong growth in operating profit as well. So our acquisitions contributed well and our base business did very well. And I think, so all parts of the business seemed to go pretty well last year. By the end of the year, we had 151,000 units reporting to our server, an increase of 50%. We've announced today that that's now 169,000 and we've split that out. We actually have a lot more customers than I think people thought. We actually have over 2,000, 2,300 customers in total. And we have quite a wide reseller network too. We did the two acquisitions and we continue to make substantial contract wins. And just in the last month or so, we've, we've done another small acquisition. And so here are our graphs showing our rate of growth of units installed on uh, reporting to servers. The, uh, announced today that 7,000 increase in our um, fleet management units and 101 increase in our insurance. So that's you know, 169 in total. And we've had some major customer wins that we've, we've announced and told you about some and some. And uh, we've had insurance wins. We've had the two big reseller wins with AA and BT. And we've got renewal of RootMonkey major contracts with Iceland and Shell. So all parts of the business have been able to contribute some, some major wins. And the acquisitions were profitable. They were cash generative and they were earnings enhancing. And so the integrations, we talk more about integrations. We've, we, are, we have moved the businesses to functional management so they less work as business units and more as part of an integrated single group. And uh, the integration from an operational point of view is, is now largely complete. A little bit about RoadSense. It's, it's a telematic sales company. Um, I think what's quite interesting, and Lorne mentions it in his notes, the, the guys who started it are two seriously experienced veterans from, from the uh, fleet management industry with experience at Master Nort and Minor Planet, bring a lot of expertise to the group. They focused on the SME market, which is something that you know, we've been less strong in recently. It cost us £800,000 in cash. It actually had revenues just under a million, broke even in the financial year that's the same as ours, and it's got 150 customers and 3,500 units installed. We think it'll be a good contributor to the group, and I think the people that have joined us will make a positive impact across the group. We have already moved finance and admin into, into a central function, and because they're predominantly a sales team, they're now embedding themselves within our, our sales organization. So I'm going to ask James to talk a little bit about some things. Good morning, everyone. I don't propose to go through um, the financial highlights in detail. Um, there are some graphs in the appendices. Uh, I just wanted to concentrate on two uh, areas, which is our cash generation and also the amount that we've capitalised as part of our development work. This is a summary of the cash flow statement from last year. So we had a very good 
um, inflow of cash from our operating activities, 4.4 million compared to 1.1 million last year. We spent 10 million pounds, which was largely the 7.7 .7 million associated with the DCS and the Root Monkey acquisitions. And we also incurred capex costs of 600,000 and we capitalized 1.8 million. Partly that was funded by uh, a total of 6 million pounds, um, mainly from the share placing that we made in December last year associated with the acquisition of Root Punky. And we also refinanced our bank facility. Um, we have a very good bank facility with HSBC and we ended up with a new 10 million facility of which at the year end we'd only drawn down half. So looking at the cash inflow from operating activities, this is a bridge which incorporates the bank debt that we have. Um, so we started the year uh, March 15 with net cash, so this is net of our bank facility, of just under 600,000 pounds. The organic operating cash flow, so that is cash flow that's been generated just by Box and Trackmate. Nothing to do with the two acquisitions, that was 3.58 million. Two acquisitions generated over £400,000 of cash in the period since they were acquired. And then we have the cost of uh, the DCS acquisition, 3.3 million, uh, the fundraising, 5.9, and the cost of the Root Monkey acquisition of 6.2 million, including repaying off their bank facility. And then there's just under 2.5 million spent on capex and capitalised development costs. So we ended the year with just over a million pounds of net debt. So looking at that organic operating cash flow, 3.58 million, so reminder, this is just track mate and box. Profit before tax was 2.1 million from those two businesses. If you add the depreciation, interest and share-based payments, that comes to 3.2 million. We had a small increase in uh, our inventories and our receivables increased as well as our payables. And we ended the year with 3.5 million. Now, the receivables and payables um, include, in the payables is included customers who pay us in advance. So in the past, we've had quite a few customers who put a tracking device in a new vehicle. They then lease the vehicle and we get paid the full three years or five years of the contract up front, including the service fees. So that's been very helpful for our cash flow. On the other side of the coin, um, we also provide finance uh, for customers. So we provide a fixed monthly fee spread over a three year or four year period. And so the way we do our accounting is on day one when we install the units, we recognize the revenue associated with the hardware and, and the installation costs but we've only received one month's fee at that point. And so there's a corresponding fees and arrears figure in our receivables. And what we've noticed over the last 12 months or so is a, is a, a trend of businesses wanting to have more mitigated deals. So less of the cash up front, more of a fixed monthly fee spread over the term of the contract. And that trend we think is going to continue so the benefit that we've had in the past from people paying up front is, is going to be reduced. Our net operating cash flow across the group is 4.4 million. We spent 600,000 on capex and capitalized development costs of 1.8 million, coming to just below 2 million for our free cash flow, which was a 51% conversion rate compared to our, of our adjusted operating profit. And that compares with a small negative 1% in the previous year. So a very good year for us. Finally, just touching on uh, development costs. Now, we have incurred a lot of um, development costs. We made a decision a year ago to significantly increase our spend on engineers. If you look at the average number of engineers that we had in 2014-15, across the whole year, it was 41. We ended the year 
2015-16 with an average of 59, and in fact, actually, at the end of March, it was 69 engineers. And our total R&D spend increased from 1.2 million uh, in the previous year to 2.8 million this year. And of that 2.8, we have actually expensed a million pounds of it. So it's gone up in total, but we've expensed a million pounds. And of the 1.8 million that we've capitalized, that has been broken down between our hardware devices, 900,000, um, our insurance products that we're working on, 826,000, and the camera technology. So, and we believe that uh, you know, TrackMate has always owned its own IP. We very much want to continue that. And in the telematics hardware, for example, we've developed the smallest self-fit device, which we believe is still the smallest self-fit device available on the market. And we're already on the fourth generation of that. In terms of uh, the, the capex of 600,000, um, there's now a short video. Um, to show you how that has been spent. You'll notice this is something that Green Flag did um, as part of their marketing. And it's for those of you that haven't been to Coles Hill and seen the uh, fixed asset investment we've made. That's a bare printed circuit board being pushed into the screen printer. So that's where all the printed circuit board gets its little blobs of solder paste <laughs> for the components to be put on. So it's now weaving its way into the into the surface mount placement machine. Now this is the fast machine that is putting down resistors and capacitors at a high speed. Um, it goes into the next machine where actually it's getting a little laser positioning the, um, the component on the head of the unit so that it's placed even more accurately. And so by the time it comes to there, it's all sitting on a printed circuit board on blobs of solder. Oh, it's getting another go in the next machine there, actually. Um, and then it gets optically inspected, make sure that all the components are in the right place and not stood up or anything. Because these are tiny components, you know. These are things smaller than you can actually see sometimes, certainly if you're as old as me. And then it goes into an oven where it then gets baked. And it goes back to have, it comes out of the oven and then it gets another optical inspection layer. But that's a, that's a board out of the latest self-fit device. And uh, see it's getting now inspected again optically to make sure that after it's come through the oven all the solders as it should be and that the components haven't moved. And then it goes into test and we, uh, <clears throat> we have a test there where we give it its hardest, we, we test it in the hardest environment it's likely to get in the field so that we replicate a full over the air update to make sure that if we have to do that it will. And there's a old technology solution. And uh, <laughs> it goes in a nice little box like that, and that is perfectly calculated, so it will fit through the post, and the post office will only charge us letter mail. It gets a label on there. I don't know if we see that in this movie, which says where it's going. Now, we probably weren't allowed to show the label of where it was going. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about the the areas of business that we're in. Um, we currently talk about fleet management insurance, and that doesn't quite sort of segment everything that we do. Fleet management is the bit of the business we've been in the longest, and we have solutions for the SME space, whether that's with a, a, our recently launched Prime, which is designed to be sold without having to, to go and visit a customer. I suppose that's the the differentiator for it, it's, it's, it's a self-fit device at the moment and it's, it's designed to give simple fleet solution at a very affordable price. We have enterprise software, that's clearly the core of our business with our major clients like AA and Sangaban and so on. And with the RootMonkey acquisition, of course, we have root optimization and, and, and workflow optimization. And that's around making sure that the, the journey selected is, is the shortest and or the quickest. We make sure that we can optimize the fleet itself so that the customer has the right mix of large, small and medium trucks if that's appropriate. We worry about the man in the van as well as the van itself. And we have a particular expertise in electric vehicles. And, and, and 
Colin, who's CEO of RootMonkey, will be giving you a demonstration of that in a bit. So we, we believe our fleet management solution now is, is, is really broader and, and second to none. We're in insurance too, and we don't talk a lot about it, but the fulfillment process that we have is quite a differentiator for us because we, we manage the whole interaction with the customer so that we get policies downloaded to us overnight, we ship it, and we make sure that the customer has a really good experience of getting that, that device installed in their vehicle, whether it's one they do themselves or whether it's done through an installer. So fulfillment's a very important part of what we do for our customers in insurance. We're investing heavily in algorithms that separate good drivers from bad drivers from a risk and a claims point of view. And we've invested a lot in creating crash detect detection algorithms because one of the big components of an insurance cost is not just the claim itself, but it's how it's managed. And so um, if, we can, if we can get our customer to be the first to contact the, the driver, then he can give his customer a better experience, probably, but certainly a much lower cost experience for the insurance company. And so crash detection is very important to, to an insurance proposition. And so those are the two things that we've talked about, you know, as being our two core propositions. But clearly we're an automotive business. You know, we had, I mean, those of you who were here last year remember that Sean Morris gave a presentation on what we call connected care. Play on words, it's our connected car strategy. And it's all around giving customers data from the vehicle that helps them manage the vehicle. So it's nothing to do with the driver, really. It's much more to do with the, with the vehicle. And we believe that we're at the forefront of this. And so we have solutions for lease car companies. We have solutions that apply to service networks. <clears throat> We've announced Kubota. That is very much an OE automotive solution. They're not really worried too much about the journeys that their earth movers have done, and nor are their customers. They're worried about the life cycle, the hours they're running, how much fuel they're doing, and you know, are they in need of some service work? And so it's very much an automotive solution. And so going forward, we're going to talk more about automotive as a separate activity from, from fleet and insurance, because we think the customer challenge is different. Now, a lot of what we do, we might call it automotive, but, you know, that, uh, that deploys to the insurance space as well because our connected care strategy, our automotive strategy, is actually the green, green flag alert me proposition that the video was about. So, you know, the lines are blurred in terms of segmentation, but the technologies and, and the core solution is quite different. And then within RootMonkey, we have real expertise in in sort of power generation, power utilization, whether it's charge post management for electric vehicles, whether it's the network itself and how to manage the generation and the distribution of electricity, you know, in the end to use less power stations and you know, not have to build new ones quite so soon. And so this is a completely different area from anything else that we currently do, but we're gonna to have to focus on it and talk about it in the future quite separately. So these are the four core, <coughs> core things that we're working on today. But funnily enough, we find ourselves in other stuff too. You know, we have a customer that does golf cart tracking. And it's all around optimizing throughput through the golf course. So if they, if they find that all these golf carts are queuing up at hole nine, they know they need to do something different at hole nine. And then we, we have a customer, and he's actually got over 2,000 units now, where he has telematics on his cleaning machine in, in, in actually supermarkets in this case. And it's all around management of the batteries in these cleaning machines so that they are fully charged at the beginning of the day and around water usage and utilization. And the customer's customer is very keen on this sort of green credential that gives him. And then of course Fortless, I mean, I, I, I don't know where you call that automotive or what, but Fortless are a unique use case because again they've got batteries in them a lot of them people worry about them hitting people as they go around um, warehouses and things so we have some unique solutions for Fortless too so what is the opportunity I mean TrackMate is, is actually working in quite a few of the really big mega trends in technology today you know we we are a big data company we collect terabytes of data every year and we're using that primarily to improve our solutions but in the end, it's a big data business. Clearly at the heart of Internet of Things, you know, we have cloud-based solutions and we're talking from you know, device to device via that. We're in the cloud. 
very involved in mobility, which is you know, how to get people from A to B without worrying about you know, what they're, whether they're walking or they're riding a train or whatever. And connected car is one of the big mega trends that we're right at the heart of. So we're, we're right in the middle of, of a lot of the major technologies that are going on at the moment. And if we look at fleet, you can see, I mean, we call it future, but we're pretty much in the future now where fleet management has been barely more than track and trace and has gone right through to how to monitor drivers' behaviour, how to spot if they're falling asleep, to try and avoid accidents, try and score people for risk. And so, so fleet management now is a superset of pretty much everything we do. And what, what the trend has done has made the ROI for telematics propositions of the sort we do overwhelming. I mean, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer decision. So it actually then becomes a decision whether it's us or somebody else. It's not a decision whether to deploy telematics, as some of the next slides will show. In Europe, the market's going to double over the next five years. And it's going to go from sort of just over 5 million telematics-enabled vehicles to over 10 million. So it's a happy place. The market's growing at 15% roughly per year. Fleet management, better than most markets. And the reason for that is it impacts so much of the operating cost of a fleet. If you think about the fuel cost, the driver wage cost, the vehicle maintenance, tyres, insurance, fleet management solutions can help the operator reduce the cost of all of those things. And so we, we can address up to, I mean, we're not going to reduce the cost by 66%, but 66% of his costs can be addressed with telematic solutions. So again, the ROI becomes very, very strong. Insurance. These are not my numbers, but they are saying that the insurance market will grow at 50% per year compound for the next five years. That's insurance-based telematics. So, I'm not going to do the maths based on our 100,000 devices because it might not be right, but you can see the potential is, is, is very, very strong. And, of course, what insurance companies are hoping to do is to stop it being a grudge purchase. You know, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, goody, I'm going to buy my insurance today. But actually, if, if, the, if the relationship with the customer improves and things like how claims are managed improves, how, whether things like our connected care solution will make the experience for an insurance customer better, then actually you might wake up and say, yeah, I'm actually going to go and buy Direct Line or somebody else because it actually is going to make my life better than one of their competitors. And if we can help our customers do that, then that's what we have to do. We are still in a fragmented market, but it is consolidating quite quickly. And you can see a lot of these numbers come from our customers' websites. Some of them are my guesses, my best guess. And so, you know, I, I might disown all these numbers, but, you know, this is where I think we are. And I think if you look at the acquisitions that have been taking place in the last, you know, 12, 24 months, there is real consolidation going. Verizon buying Fleetmatics, which I think has got to go through some regulatory bits and pieces, putting it with Tologis is going to make them number one in fleet management by some way. Um, the VCs are quite interested in, in the space, and they bought Masternode 12, 18 months ago and complied it with Fleet Corps. Tom Tom's very acquisitive, bought Finder um, just recently, added 60,000 units. Digital was acquired by Novotel Wireless. And some of the, some of the valuations are really you know, pretty, pretty strong. <laughs> so, you know, lots of opportunity to be part of this consolidation. And as you can see, we're not doing too bad. I mean, in insurance, Octo, you know, are, are the big gorilla in this space. Um, how, how, do you, how do you compete in that market? Because you're a very, on there, you're, you're a very small player. What is it um, that enables you to compete against a company that's an order of magnitude bigger in terms of what you can offer? Well, you know, you'd expect me to say that I think our data's better. I do. I think ownership of all the elements of the solution helps. You know, we, we make our own devices, we do all the own firmware for it, and what we think that gives us is if we actually have a problem, we know that we have to fix it within our own resources. And so I, I do think our customers are comforted by that. 
that they know. Because, you know, what we do is very hard. It's t technically, it's very challenging stuff. Uh, and so customers deep down know that they might have a problem every now and then. And so it's, they, ha they will back a company that they know has the resources and the, the will and the ability to respond quickly. And because we've invested heavily in application engineering support, we've got this you know, very large engineering team now, I think we are capable of giving our customers the best experience. So this is probably where we get to the most interesting part of the day for you guys. Um, we've got two presentations. The first is by Matt Monington here, who's our newly appointed CTO. And he's going to talk to you about um, our next generation camera product line. So John mentioned I'm CTO at TrackMate. And what that means for me is that I get to spend my days with an absolutely fantastic bunch of engineers and, um, and product staff who have really got some quite, quite good technical skills um, gained over many years within our market and are capable of doing some great stuff. So for me, as a technical guy, that's fantastic. These are a couple of products that have come out um, recently. So on the right-hand side, we've got our um, latest dash cam, which is capable of recording really good quality HD video at 60 frames a second. So we get some absolutely fantastic video imagery of that for incidents that happen. And um, on the left, we've got the latest generation of our plug-in device that John mentioned that we use for our insurance solutions. So this is going through um, field trials and approvals at the moment. There are some coming hot off the, uh, the surface mount lines that you saw on the video there for us to do that program with. And this improves again our product. And, and you spoke about differentiators. This product for us is really one of the things that helps us to compete in this market. It's a fantastically small device. That's important for us because it means it fits into a lot more vehicles than the larger devices. So we get a much better fit rate for it. Um, but also with the expertise that we have for such a small package that's installed inside a car under a lot of metal work, it has absolutely amazing radio reception for its um, GSM and GPS. And this version of it improves that further. It also improves the manufacturability of it so that we can make it um, easier in our factories so that we can increase our throughput. And um, yeah, it's something that we're really proud of. But um, we're obviously spending a lot of time now looking at how we integrate our camera and our telematic um, technology into one proposition. And we think that's really important for us going forwards. But the first thing that's been important to us is that we want to really get that right. We want to put a lot of effort into planning what we do when we put them together and not just throw these two bits of technology together in a rush. So the first thing we've been considering is what we do. And we set ourselves a set of rules. And the first rule is that we didn't want any compromises in what we were doing. We've got really good camera systems and we've got fantastic telematic systems. What we don't want is what some of the products that you see on the market are, which is a compromised camera and a compromised telematic system. We've got a reputation in both areas and that's really important for us to keep that reputation together. So the first thing is best of everything into the um, combined package. The other thing that's important to us is that we have opportunity to sell these combined solutions into new and existing customers. But we also know that we have customers with mixed fleets that could be passenger cars, light commercial vehicles and heavy goods vehicles. And the solution they want could be different throughout that range. So you might want some cameras in your heavy goods vehicles, but in your passenger vehicles, you might want our plug-in device. So it's really important to us that the solution that we create are interoperable between each other so that you could have a mix of installed devices, plug-in devices and camera devices that contain exactly the same technology, that can report into the same system, and that when you look at the results, they look the same for all of them, so that you don't have to swap between systems to see data, and that so when we do our driver scoring, the score for a camera-based product is exactly the same as the score for a plug-in product, so that you can assess your drivers like for like. For our first product, we wanted to make a single box product. We wanted one box with all of the telematics and the cameras in, so that we had a really easy installation, so that it was quick, easy to get into the car, um, to keep the installation costs down. And we want to make sure that we get as much in there as we can. We're being really ambitious for our first device so that it's got everything in there that the uh, customers need. But also, you know, cameras, we can capture stills, we can capture video, um, we can capture event video, telematics, we can track people, we can score them, we can do all the connected care. But when we put them together, there's some real opportunity to do some more interesting things. We currently measure driver behaviour based on the telematics devices that we have. But now we've got a camera in the car, we can understand more about the way that the driver's acting in the car. So we can tell if they're distracted, we can tell if they're looking away from the road, maybe at a mobile phone. Um, we can tell if they're drowsy when they're driving, you know, so if they're starting to fall asleep. Um, and we can tell if they drift around in their lane, 
um, we can see what the road sign says for speed and we can know what speed they're traveling. So it creates a whole big opportunity for us to add extra dimensions to how we score drivers so that we can really get the best in-depth driver behavior score that, uh, that we can. As an engineer, something that's really difficult is every single one of our customers always wants everything to work slightly differently, which when you're trying to engineer a solution is just the worst of all worlds, but we're really good at it. For our telematic solution, it's really tailorable. And if you look at the camera solutions that are out there, they pretty much do a fixed job. So they, they, they're set up to do a fixed job of work. They'll capture a video when there's an ethanol event and they'll send you telematic data up to, the, uh, up to the cloud. It was really important to us that we maintain the flexibility in our solutions so that we can address all of our existing customer base and everybody that's gonna come along. So we've really built a lot of configurability and I'll have a quick demo to show you how that works. Because we can't anticipate the use cases of everybody that we're gonna meet when we're out there selling the products. So we need a system that can be adapted to meet those use cases. And so that's really important to us to maintain that. And again, I think that's one of the USPs that we have is our configurability, our adaptability. And in-house. So um, John mentioned that it's really important to us that we own our value chain, that we have the IP for everything that we do. It's important for that adaptability with our clients to make things configurable, to be able to deploy solutions that are tailored to people's needs. You need to own the IP. And that's a real advantage to us, and we need to maintain that with the uh, combined camera telematic system. And so the system is designed, developed, and manufactured in-house. It'll be made out of our COSIL manufacturing facility. And the engineers on our COSIL and Shaftesbury sites are working on the hardware, the firmware, and the software that goes with it. So we'll have built the entire <laughs> IP for how to create these cameras and all the algorithms in-house. What that gives us when we put all that together and we take the um, opportunities that are there of combining it is a four pillars of features that we're developing. So there's the core telematic features, so our driver behavior, first notification of loss, the standard real-time tracking that we have, high resolution data, which is really important to us. This is where we get really high speed data back up to the servers to do really good quality driver behavior scoring. Harsh events, so if you accelerate, corner, brake, too hard, all those things, we can score those. And connected care, so with the unit can do all of the connected care features that we have, so we can still assess whether your battery is in good condition or not, and all those things. Camera features, um, we want to have at least two camera heads so we can have a rear or driver facing camera and a front facing camera. Video recording capability, so we record on loop while you drive into the camera. Still capture, um, there are use cases where it's useful to know what's going on but not so useful you'd want to pay to upload a video but to upload a smaller still we can then enable use cases where you get pictures back up to the server. Um, auto event upload, so we don't want people to have to choose when events are sent up. We want them to be able to create rules that make it the camera decide when events should be going up to the uh, system. Manual event upload, so there'll be a button you can press. If something happens and you want to get a video up to your fleet manager, you can press the button and up the video goes and your fleet manager will get a notification that something's happened. And live streaming. So um, we've got a 4G modem in the camera and we can live stream picture in picture video. Um, so you can see the road ahead and you can see the driver. So if there is an incident um, that you've been notified of by the driver, you can see what's going on at the roadside, so you can help in advising the driver or any other third-party services what to do in that situation. Connectivity, I mentioned it's um, 4G. It's Bluetooth 4, so it's got a Bluetooth low energy chip on there, and that enables us to connect to the customer's mobile phone, but also to a range of peripherals that we're creating to complement the camera. It's compatible with the apps that we've um, deployed over the last year. So you'll be able to see video, whether it be um, in the uh, cameras that can stream it live or whether it be replaying videos back down from the server via your mobile phone. Um, the hardware's Wi-Fi ready. The first version that goes out won't have the Wi-Fi chip on, but it's Wi-Fi ready, which helps us with streaming to the mobile phone, offloading data via the customer's own home network. So we can cache video and upload it when it connects to your home network. Um, it's really modular. So the, uh, the design will be able to be scaled up and scaled down. Um, and it'll have flexible airtime plans. Obviously, if you're streaming and uploading video, one of the big costs is airtime. And so we can configure the plans to have different sized buckets of data in the cloud and also different airtime plans. And then we can tailor how your unit works so that you don't overrun your data plan. And something that's really interesting for us is, the, um, is getting involved in the ADAS, Advanced Driver <laughs> Assistance Systems um, space. 
So we're working on algorithms at the moment for collision warning, so we can detect if you're approaching the car in front too fast, and we can raise a warning to the driver. We can detect that you're in a lane, and we can detect when you're um, drifting from the lane, and with our connected care product, it gives us a potential to know whether you're indicating or not as well, so we can decide whether to send you alerts or not. We can tell if the driver's distracted, if they're looking away. Uh, we can tell if they're falling asleep. Um, interesting is facial recognition. So at the moment, for driver ID, you have to have some kind of ID tag. Um, but if we can recognise drivers' faces, then we can actually just recognise them automatically. And we can do that in an anonymous way. So we just send IDs up, you know, the same as you get with your passport. So we don't have to store those pictures up at the server to do the job. And... Um, Behaviour scoring, as I mentioned, we can use all of that data to, to more accurately score how people drive. Field trials, you know, wider field trials for us in quarter three this year, so starting soon. We've got it running around in a um, limited number of cars at the moment, including mine, um, and entering production in early 2017. So what does it look like? So this is our first camera. Um, there's a picture of it in the car. I've got a prototype unit with me here as well. So this, is, this is, gives you an idea of the size of it. It's a dual head camera, but we put a lot of effort into making sure that this camera is really um, able to match all of the installation use cases we have. So we have people who want one camera, two cameras, rear-facing cameras, front-facing cameras, driver-facing cameras. So this, from this one unit that we can manufacture, um, we've got removable heads which can be secured with a security screw for fleet installations. But what we can do is remove the head from the camera, and if I pop that down, we can pop in place a blanking plug and so it becomes a one-head camera. But also, more interestingly, we can pop the blanking plug on, and then to go with the camera, we've got a remote, um, remote mounting head, and uh, this could be fitted up in the windscreen or in the rear of the vehicle, and then the camera head that you took off can connect onto here. There's obviously a wire that I haven't got with me that then runs, gets installed around the vehicle. And so from the one unit, we can have single-headed camera, dual-head camera with driver facing, Front facing, rear facing, or even further back, we can get about a 15 meter cable um, connected from this camera head to the front of the camera. So, what that means for our operations team is they only have to make one thing. They don't have to make all of these different variants of camera, and we can serve it all from this one particular need. Um, so, this mounts on the windscreen. The heads rotate so you can tune them so they're perfectly focused on whatever it is you want them to focus on. And because of it, the fact that you can remove the heads at the point of installation. If the installer needs to move it somewhere else to, to, to do the job, you can decide then. We don't have to decide up front, so it's, it's fantastic for us. Um, it's got the event button that you see in the centre, which is surrounded, you can see it on the picture, it's not lit up here, surrounded with two LED lights in a ring, which one, one of which gives you the modes of operation, so you can tell if the unit's working, connected, and everything's OK. Uh, and the second one, um, we can use the driver feedback device. So within this, we can give you a red, amber, or green score for your driving, so the driver can see real-time the score that's going back to his fleet manager. So as I say, we've packed everything in here. Driver behaviour, driver feedback, two camera heads, ADAS, all into this one box for our first camera. So this is Trackmate Swift. This is our, this is our fleet, um, fleet solution. And we're adding the cameras directly into this existing solution. So this is my car. She's down in Shaftesbury. And if we go to the bottom here, we can have a look at um, a journey I did when I was last with my car. Please ignore the harsh acceleration and braking events. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a, this is a journey that, um, that one of our engineers, and you'll get to see him in a minute, and he, you can tell he's an engineer um, from the beard. Um, so this is a journey he did in doing some testing on... <laughs> in, do, in doing some testing. What you see here are the standard waypoints that we get. So this is capturing, this is set up to capture data every five seconds, so we get a waypoint in from the car every five seconds. Um, we capture harsh acceler acceleration and braking events, and what we've done with this camera is every time you have one of those, it's set to upload a um, video. And also, at the start and the end of the journey, it uploads a still, so you can tell who was driving the vehicle as well. So if we go ahead and have a, have a quick look, you can, um, you can see the still that was uploaded at the start of the journey <laughs> of, our, of our engineer. That's Mike, who is as fast and fantastic an engineer as you expect from someone with that beard. Um, so we can see, for sure you know, who was driving at the start of this journey. And you can see it's time-stamped on the way out, so it matches up exactly with the points that we get. Down here, and I was, I was a little upset about this because this is my car that he was testing with, <laughs> is a harsh braking event where he was um, going a bit too quick down a single-track lane. So this is a video uploaded on demand. 
by the, by the, and you can see a car comes in and he does an emergency stop and nearly hits a wall. Um, I was quite pleased because I was looking for a video to use and it came to me. I was also quite upset that, uh, yeah, he was driving my car quite so quickly. Um, and we've got another one here for a harsh acceleration and we've got it set up to, to get a picture at the end of the journey. I mentioned about it being configurable, this system. We've got a fantastic new um, feature that we've created to give us that configurability. And it's a new um, trigger action module. Um, if you're into um, IoT and, uh, and that sort of thing, you'll be used to these software modules that knit together and when something happens, they trigger an action. And that's what we've added to our Swift solution to enable us to get the uh, camera use cases fulfilled. So if I have a quick look here. When our unit generates um, an event, it all comes back to the server and they all have names. And so what we can do here is if we pick my car, so if we pick change the resource, and we pick my car, and then I go into here, <coughs> I can pick from any number of the events that come back from our unit. So there are camera solutions out there that you buy it and it'll upload a crash. And if that's what you want, that's great. If the use case of your company is something different, well, okay, that's too bad. What we can do here is we can build the use case to suit you. Our application engineers can do this. Once we've got the, uh, once we've got the thing all sorted out and we know where we are, we'll be able to extend it out to our customers. They can configure it themselves as well. Okay? So if I go into here, if what's important to you is that at the start of a journey you capture a picture, which is what we saw there, then that's super easy. I go in here and I pick the journey start event and I tell it to upload a photo and I decide which camera I want it from. So I want all cameras, so I'll get the, um, out the front and the driver, and how many seconds you want before and afterwards. So we take a still every second, so if you want a few before and a few afterwards, you can get them there. What's really great about this is that we can also add other things in here, so date, time, where you are, if you're in a point of interest as well. So if it's important to you to see who's driving a car when a journey starts after 10 o'clock at night, then you can get it here and you can get it to send you an SMS as well. So you know one of your cars started a journey out of hours, and you can get a picture of who's doing it. But there are some other really good use cases for this. So you can set up points of interest in our system. And so you can set up a point of interest around a delivery area, and when it enters that point of interest, you can get it to send you a video looking into there. So you, again, you've got some evidence that, that driver arrived there at a particular time, and you've got it on video. So if you're having trouble with that, you can prove it. So you can really build any use case you want out of this which is going to be a real advantage for us in this market. So this is, a, this is a video. This is actually taken, this is a screencast. So this is my computer recording live stream. And I mentioned that we can do live streaming over 4G. This will just show you how quickly our camera reacts to a request to live streaming. Um, so if I go and press play, you'll see the same driver. Um, so he's out driving already. I'm pressing the, uh, the live cam button, selecting my vehicle. And when I press this button, a, unit, a message gets sent to the unit to start sending video into the server. And you'll see just how quick it arrives. So that's real time, how long it took for that video to start and start streaming up to our server. So this is me watching it live on the desktop. Um, what's really good from a fleet manager's perspective is you can see that um, camera moving. If you look at the green icon on the map, you'll see it moving at exactly the same pace. <coughs> so you get the telematics GPS points through and the camera through in sync at the same time. So if your drivers are out on the road and you want to see what's going on, you can absolutely see it here. You can see exactly where they are on the map and exactly what's going on. And any minute now, some um, school kids are about to step out from the side of the road in front of Mike, and he'll make another emergency stop. Um, I should really stop letting him drive my car. Um, but it's fantastic. It's really good. So it's live streaming, event streaming, and still upload, all built in. So it does everything that the range of cameras that are on the market currently do, but all in one package, which is going to be really fantastic for us. And that's me. Marvellous. Well, thank you, Matt. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about RouteMonkey now. So I'd like to introduce you to Colin, Colin Ferguson, who is CEO of RouteMonkey, and he'll get to talk a little bit about what we've been doing on that. So I'm going to show a, a short video, one minute long, uh, just to give you a little bit of context about what RouteMonkey does, what we do in terms of our algorithms and solution, uh, and then I'm going to do a, a live uh, demonstration of our algorithms and our integrated uh, solution. RouteMonkey is an incredibly easy system for fleet operators to use. The transport company receives the orders from their customers for delivery to multiple destinations. 
The jobs are imported into the Root Monkey system, which consolidates all of the orders and then calculates the most efficient route. In some cases, we are running millions of scenarios to calculate the best outcome, and all in a fraction of the time it would take an employee to work it all out. Root Monkey then transmits the delivery schedule to the driver's handheld device, which can automatically sat-nav him to the destination. As the drivers work to their schedule, the Route Monkey system makes it possible for the transport office to track the vehicles in real time via GPS. At the destination, the recipient signs for the goods and Route Monkey instantaneously communicates this information to the transport office, confirming the job is complete. The Route Monkey system communicates the next destination to the driver according to the schedule and the process continues. So the application I'm going to go through um, is an integrated uh, version of Route Monkey with uh, Swift, as in product that, that Matt showed earlier. But we have two versions, uh, a TrackMate version for TrackMate customers who would like the, the Route Monkey algorithm integrated, and then the opposite, a Route Monkey led version with Swift integrated because there are different types of client requirements. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate the, the latter. Um, I'm very passionate about this system um, and what we do. My background is uh, fleet transport logistics. That's where I've come from. Uh, one of the reasons I don't have much hair. Um, I've got my CPC. I was that transport planner uh, and I, I realised that, you know, to automate the process uh, efficiently, consistently produce plans that are, are better than manual plans can be produced uh, you know is something that the, the fleet sector is crying out for and, and so has come to pass over the last seven years. The objective of this type of system is to match all the orders, deliveries, tasks, visits, appointments because as John said earlier it can be mobile workforce driven not just fleet logistics and match them against the resources and the resources can be vehicles, people, infrastructure depots. So it's a little bit uh, more powerful than say just route optimization. There's lots of products in the market that do that. Really that's just sequencing jobs in the correct order where this is business objective driven optimization. So the business tells the algorithms the objectives it wants to work to, which could be constructing the routes, the plans and the schedules in the most cost efficient way, could be the most profitable way. So the routes that can be produced from a system such as this uh, through profit planning is different to the routes you would get from the best cost plan or the best emissions. So we do a lot of work in the public sector uh, around emission planning and around electric vehicles. And the optimization is planning to conserve the energy on the vehicles taking into account the vehicle attributes. So there's a lot more to it than just the sequencing of the routes. Um, but with any system like this, the first thing you have to do is set your resources up. Now, I'm hoping that what you see from th this integrated system is, is a very simple and easy system to use. So my background coming from transport, I know what transport offices are like. You want the minimum mouse clicks possible. So you just run through the, the process as you can. So whilst under the bonnet, the algorithm is very, very powerful, uh, and there's multiple algorithms uh, in certain products, uh, depending on what the use case is, uh, the user interface is very easy to use. So just talking you through some of the, the resource, uh, resource information that we capture uh, so you're aware what the, the system can do is we would capture um, the vehicle ID, the registration, the depot uh, or location or home location where the, the, the resource is based. So that could be applicable to engineers um, and the capacity uh, of that resource. So that could be um, cubic capacity weight, could be the number of appointments, visits in a day, it could be the range, it could be the area, um, or the footprint on the, the particular resource. Um, as was mentioned earlier as well, we're not just optimising the, the assets, we're optimising the people. So to take in working time directive, um, to take in driver's hours, shift patterns, uh, link it in with the tachograph uh, you know, information that we have. So it really is uh, an end-to-end -end solution that we now have that we can offer the marketplace. And that's one of the, the USPs uh, of this solution. The other side of the, the equation is the jobs uh, and the tasks. 
Now, um, you've seen some of the, the clients that, that, that we service at uh, RootMonkey, uh, and that is a wider group. Uh, so your shells of the world, your icelands. But we do a lot in the retail sector. So a lot of the large parcel companies already use RootMonkey. So the yodels of the world, the APCs. So when you get a text message on your mobile phone uh, to say the ETA, that's come from our uh, technology in certain, in certain instances. Uh, we also do a lot in the retail sector. So Netta Porter in London uh, is an example of that. So our algorithms are, are behind their website. So I'm going to show you that as a use case uh, just now. So as a user of the system, uh, as I say, we, we've tried to make it very, very easy uh, for the users to, to, to uh, you know, use the system on a da daily basis. But this is also a modelling tool as much as it's a day-to-day -day operational tool. So you can actually use this tool to forecast uh, volume uh, of vehicles you might need if winning new contracts, which gives the system another you know, dynamic. Um, and it can be both used for proactive scheduling, which is today for tomorrow, which is what most companies do, or with the advent of you know, Amazon and, and on-demand services coming in. Um, luckily enough, we uh, saw that coming in, uh, you know, into play a few years back and designed the algorithms to have a real-time uh, dynamic, which is why you know, the relationship for, for TrackMate was a no-brainer for RootMonkey, because uh, linking in with the GPS to know where the vehicles are in real time offers clients that on-demand solution, which is absolutely where the market's heading. So as a user, what I've done now is I've shown all my jobs on the, the, the map at the left-hand side. So in, in essence, that's the problem that if I was uh, back in my transport days, I was trying to solve manually. So getting the Collins Atlas out, so yes, I am that old, uh, or going onto Google and you know, looking through um, you know, how I could match that against my resources. But this is what you do now. So we load the, the jobs, uh, schedules, appointments, visits, collections, deliveries, whatever they may be, into the system. And we optimise them. And that's all we do. So as a fleet manager, it can now go away, make a cup of tea, be on the phone, do what they need to do, because the algorithm is doing the heavy lifting now and taking into account all the vehicle attributes the time windows for the job, the uh, start time of the vehicle, the capacity, the cost, is it working to planning, is it not? So it's taking all those uh, attributes into account right now and then producing a plan based on those, uh, those values. Okay. So what was that, I don't know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds? That's the plan produced. Okay. So one of the first benefits of this type of technology is absolutely the speed uh, that you produce an automated plan. So if we start to scale that up, if we think about people at Yodel and APC, thousands and thousands of, of deliveries you know, per day. Um, if I think about Iceland, it's 60,000 transactions uh, you know, every week. So nearly finished the, the, the process. Um, and where we've got to is within you know, a few minutes, we've managed to plan a whole day's work. So you can think of the, you know, the benefits of that as to any organisation. Um, this is a small data set just to show you as an example, uh, but it gives you a, a, a feel and flavour. Now, you might not be able to, to see back, back there, but you've got a dashboard of statistics. So if this is run in real time, where we've got total miles, we've got total cost and, and other metrics there, if another job comes in in real time that's just been placed as an order, you can see the dashboard changing. So their cost would presumably go up if there's more jobs to do, but it lets the operator see the price of that extra transaction that just came in. Because often one job can invoke another vehicle or more cost. So it's quite important and it lets the user see, well actually, you know, that job that's come down near, near, near Southampton, do we really want to do that tomorrow? Because the cost has just jumped up £100 and we're maybe only getting £50 revenue for the job. Big plan on the M25. Yep. How quickly does the system pick it up and rebase everything? Uh, very quick. So. We've got live traffic, so if I hit the live traffic now, so as you quite rightly said there, an M25, there's some, you know, some red bits because that's always where, where it's busy. You can zoom into London, generally speaking, on, on any given day, it's all red, yeah, as, as, we, <laughs> as we know. Now, uh, and as, as if by magic, live real time, there it is. So we, that's where the power of the GPS comes in because we can optimise on a plan you know, because we don't really know if the vehicle's actually done that. So we must tap into the, the, the telematics in the vehicle to say, right, okay, we now know where you are. 
We now know what you should be doing. We now know the traffic conditions and we now know the skill set of that vehicle. Therefore, we're going to redeploy that in real time. So that's done server side. So what would happen is the, the long and lats come back every minute from the, the, the vehicle uh, and then uh, we optimise based on that. So it's a constant optimisation. So we set the, the optimisation time in the settings here, which is the real time schedule time. And that's how it's done. If there are collections involved, uh, can you dynamically be plan the driver to do the schedule collection shift? So if you get the job come up relatively close to someone, yeah. can you move the schedule around to allow that? that? That's exactly what happens. So if I, if I save the schedule, so, so let's pretend it's yesterday, we've done the schedule, it's now today. Because you've got this plan and then you've got actual, yeah. So if I go to planned orders and pretend it's now today, then what would happen is um, I would have a bunch of schedules uh, that I would be working to until something changed. So there are my schedules. Okay. So if I wanted to draw that particular schedule on the map, that's, that's, that's that particular route. So that's the planned route. Okay. Now that planned route has an ETA uh, collection delivery time. Okay. Now, in the actual uh, jobs themselves, you can mark a collection as a C, a delivery as a D, an appointment as an A. So, you know, common sense. But if something changes uh, as per the last answer, then dynamically server side it would just recalculate. And then what we're able to do with the integration with SWIFT, which we weren't able to do uh, you know, before that, uh, is then compare the planned and actual. So therefore, we've got three things here. We've got the proactive planning, so today for tomorrow, maybe. You've got what happens on the day, which is a dynamic part, and then you've got what happened afterwards and measure that. So if that's the actual route, once the route has actually happened, dynamically or otherwise the collections have changed, then you can measure it on the map uh, as a different colour. So what you can see there uh, is that particular route. The driver's deviated, so there's a couple of extra jobs here. So that could have been an extra collection that wasn't factored in. So then you can compare on a KPI the cost planned against actual. So that's, that's the power, and I, and I don't want to underemphasize that. That's a very, very, very powerful tool. Um, I don't know yet of anyone in the UK that's got an NTN -end tool that does exactly that. Okay, so to wrap up the, the presentation, um, once uh, the routes are produced, uh, then as you saw in the short video, they can then be sent out to the mobile device. So therefore, by sending out to the mobile device, you can do it from this interface, or it can be sent back to the system that the data came from, and it can go automatically. Um, and if I send this job out to a mobile device, then that's all you do. So whilst I've done a lot, of, a lot of talking on the presentation about how it works, if I ran through that again and just pushed the buttons, it might only take me two minutes to do the whole process, which for a transport manager may take them two, three, four, five, six hours, depending on who they are. And it may be multiple people. So if you haven't worked it out already, it now only needs one person to operate the whole planning, whether it's on a national scale, uh, a local scale or a regional scale. But does every bit of your system now talk to every bit of TrackMate system seamlessly? The integration has happened completely? Yeah. Or you're running in parallel and talking to each other? No. So there's two flavours, two different systems. So this is the, the RootMonkey version that pulls in the, the long and lat and the GPS tracking information where a client might want a primary version being optimization, so they lead with optimization and they, they want the telematics as a, as a secondary. Where clients already have telematics or obviously Swift, then we can integrate the, the uh, algorithm in. That has already been done. So the algorithm today is integrated with Swift. Continued development is still ongoing on the user interface, but the algorithm is complete. Yeah. This is such an obvious problem, there must be a lot of competitors in this. You would think. There's not. Um, I mean, in the UK, there's less than half a dozen people do this type of technology because we need to separate route optimization from dynamic full optimization, which needs a bigger, powerful al algorithm to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we thought that to begin with. I had thought that in the early days, but we've come to realise that you can't just come out of university, for example, and write an algorithm. It needs a lot more than that. So we have lots of data scientists <coughs> headed up by Professor David Korn, which is one of the world's leading experts in heuristic algorithms. So why we think there's not that many companies doing it is it's not that easy to write a, a proper algorithm to, to do this sort of thing. Um, is this much more orientated towards the enterprise customer or would it also be applicable to the smaller business operating much smaller fleet size yeah. or a different price point? 
you know, what, not wanting to um, cannibalise your, your margins for big enterprise guys? Sure. So we started out at Rootmonkey, um, you know, before the relationship with TrackMate in the first two to three years, predominantly selling this type of technology to the types of businesses that I worked in, uh, which was a problem that was originally solving. So fleets 10 to maybe a few hundred vehicles. Um, I think if I look at our client base now, and we count the, the Yodos, the APCs, the Shells, the Icelands, the Netta Porters, they're all big names. So really, this type of technology covers anyone from five vehicles up to 10,000, possibly more. Yeah. I think it might be worth adding to that that there's clearly an opportunity to migrate from a CapEx model where customers pay and they buy a project and then they're, they're paying a relatively modest amount of support fees to a pure pay-per-click, if you like. And that would integrate very well with our, our overall strategy in terms of you know, the fleet management solution. So there's, 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 there's a project going on to do that too. Okay, so just a few more slides. Um, this is a sort of strategy presentation, so it's the sort of first time we perhaps mentioned the word, um, but it's simple enough. We have three core strategies here. We want to increase the number of things reporting to our servers. We want to own the majority of our IP, and we will continue to seek complementary acquisitions. It's a sort of both driving organic growth and supplementing it with acquisitions. And so the actions that you've seen today, we're integrating cameras with um, cameras and SaaS optimization into, into our core products. We're building more and more intelligence-based insights so that we give our customers more and more value from the data that we generate for them. You know, we have been expanding our resources. We've talked about the engineering expansion, which, you know, has been strong and continues, you know, we've got open vacancies today. But actually, we have been growing our sales teams very, very strongly. It, we, we, we announced we probably would. And, and so in the last four or five months, we've added 12 heads. Um, because actually, one of our limitations has been the number of frogs we can kiss, if you like. Um, we, are, we are moving more, to a, more and more to a business unit structure, focusing on, on verticals, and I've, I've alluded to that. Um, and we have solution strategies for large, medium and small, all the different types of customer, you know, whether it's tier one, customers tier two and so on. Um, and I think everybody knows from our last year's accounts, I think it's 97% of our revenue was generated in the UK. Um, so we have a very significant presence in the UK market. And most of our competitors, the ones that people say are much bigger than us, um, have a much wider footprint. We've already advised that we're, we're going to China. It wasn't necessarily our first choice, but it's a pretty significant customer that's encouraged us to do that. Um, and uh, I suspect we'll end up in America fairly soon. And we are scaling our, our Czech business quite successfully at the moment. So our footprint will grow over the, over the coming years. A little bit about Brexit. We talked about it in the trading update. You know, we're going to do everything we can to minimise the effect of, of, of Brexit. We, we buy 10 million plus of electronic components a year. And so they're all, in the end, they're all priced in dollars. It doesn't matter whether we pay pounds, we pay euros. Electronic components are priced in dollars globally. And so, you know, potentially there's been well over a million pounds worth of cost impact due to the exchange rate. We're anticipating the effect being about half a million due to that. And we'll do everything we can to mitigate it. But we thought it was sensible to you know, let everybody know that that's a real impact on us. And we have, coming back to my 3% international sales, we have a lot less natural hedge in our business. It presents some opportunities. But at the moment, that's the, way, that's the fact. I think the important thing, though, is that I think I, I was quite worried that Brexit would make you know, finance directors who are naturally risk averse hesitate to make decisions. I don't think we're witnessing that. I don't think we have any customer that's saying to us, oh, I'm putting off my decision because of the uncertainty due to Brexit, which I think is a good thing. So just a little bit about today's update. We've had very strong order entry growth in the five months here to date. Organic, if you, if you remember last year, we said our revenues went up 28% organically. <coughs> 
year to date, our orders received have gone up 27%. So we continue to drive the organic growth of this business very, very successfully. And the acquisitions on top. We've increased the number of units reporting. Our order entry in the first five months in the latter part of last year have not translated into revenue growth at the same rate in the first half of this financial year. That, you know, that's just a fact, it's a timing thing. You know, some of our big contract announcements that we, we've talked about, Al Allianz, Kyoto and so on, all actually deploy in the second half. And there are some others that will deploy in the second half that you know, we haven't announced. Um, so, year on year, our half year profitability will be less, our sales will be more than last year, but not as much more as the order entry suggests. And we have this half a million pound exchange rate movement. Despite all that, we still think that we're on track to meet market expectations for the full year, ignoring the Brexit effect. So, very much skewed second half. So, um, the investment case, you know, we have, we, have a, we have a good financial model, we have the resources, we actually have the management resources to to do the growth. You can see you've, you, you've, you've met two new members of our senior team today, both good guys, as you can see. And so we continue to Im improve the, 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 you know, the, the human capital within our business. We remain in a very fragmented market that's growing very well. So that <coughs> creates opportunity. And the things that make customers want what we do aren't going away. You know, fuel economy, worrying about risk, you know, all these environmental impacts. And it's quite nice to declare a dividend. I know not everybody wanted one, but uh, it's, uh, it's good to be able to get on the dividend list. So we get to questions. <coughs> you referred to um, just a timing thing. Uh, FinCap referred to frustrating delay. <laughs> on the uh, first half, second half split, they have to put a table in to justify how they think you can still get to the full year figure. At the end of the day, are you just ducking that this is a profit warning? The, the forecast has been reduced because of Brexit. Yep. There is no other reduction. FinCap's note um, you know, represents the market expectation. We, um, you know, we, we do an awful lot of work on forecasting, on pipeline, on uh, confidence about projects coming in in the timeline. Because you know, sometimes it's not a confidence of whether the project will come in, it's a confidence in when the project will come in. And, and those, you know, it, those of us, and there are quite a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, who, who run businesses day to day have to live with that, that dilemma continuously. Currently, I mean, I'm, we're not ducking the question of a profits warning because it's not a profits warning. Uh, you've quantified the investment into development and R&D. Could you just perhaps flesh out what your investment's been into additional human resource? Have you put told people by to what extent that's affecting the P&L in the short term? You're, well, the short you're scaling up for a bigger... Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm just wondering what the investment has been. Well, salespeople are very expensive, as you know, and they range from, you know perhaps being 100k people net to being, you know, 40, 50, 60. So, you know, 12 people is, is a significant investment. And you're right, sales investment goes through the P&L in advance of generating revenues. And, and so our first half costs are higher a result of those investments um, than, uh, than perhaps the revenue growth would justify in that period. And then linked to that, if I may, um, obviously you've, made a, you've increased the amount of R&D maturity, but relative to the people you have on your target side, how big is your investment in new technology? Well, we're, you can see that we think spending 10% of revenues in core R&D is necessary. Um, and we expect to continue to do that. As we, as we grow, because we think, you know, in the end, that's what we are. We're a technology company. Um, so uh, how that compares with some of our competitors, you might know some of them better than I do, but I, I think that's top end. <coughs> you said that 97% um, of sales revenue comes from the UK. So do you plan to get that significantly down, have some, a lot more overseas sales, and how long will that take? Well, those are quite a few good questions. Um, 
Well, it means that you're totally dependent on what happens in the UK, aren't you? We, we have been last year, that's exactly right. Um, we, um, historically, we sold product overseas. So when we've, when we've had a, a, a larger international business, it's been selling hardware to other telematics companies, primarily. We are less interested in doing that. You know, if, if a customer comes and asks us to buy our hardware, we think about it and we probably will sell it. We are not actively sort of patrolling the world looking for customers for that for hardware in the way we used to because we think our future is being a solutions company. So our growth will come about through following, actually, as I said at the last time we met, following some significant customers into their core markets because the UK is a leading market for telematics in Europe. And so large, large companies, whether it's lease companies or roadside assistance companies or whatever, use the UK as a uh, market leading case. And so if you can win the customer here and then promise to scale with them into their other core markets, th then you're, you, know, you can grow that way on the back of that. Um, you, you specify the number of units that, um, uh, that uh, respond to uh, connect with your servers. On average, how long is, uh, is a lifetime for you in terms of an income generating item? There is a huge difference between fleet and um, insurance. Our churn in fleet is single digit percentage. Okay? Our churn in insurance is, you know, high. <laughs> and that's because the policies that are sold are sold to young drivers, and young drivers change their car, they change, well, they get rid of cars, they change their insurance provider. So, so the churn in young driver insurance is very high. Now, it's slightly different with our relationship with Marmalade because they sell insurance as part of a lease package on a car, and so the churn is a lot less on that. But if you take the, the other two insurance companies we're doing business with, then the churn is high. Is there any chance of selling your equipment to the car companies? Because, I mean, if they've got sat-navs now, they have faction approved alarms, you know, why wouldn't they start putting cameras into the cars or telematics into the cars? Well, a lot of car companies do, in a sense. I mean, you know, if you, if you buy yourself a high-end Mercedes or BMW, the first thing they try and sell you is, you know, Mercedes Connect or something. And, and that's a telematics proposition. Um, there are, we think, opportunities for us to work with car companies. And, you know, I have to say, Sean Morris is with one today, but that's, that's you know, early days, so we'll see. Hello. Hello. I have two questions. Um, the first question is for James, and why, why have you chosen to capitalise development costs rather than expense them? And the second question is for John, um, regarding the non-exec directors. Um, last year in the accounts, uh, fees were paid for, the, for advice on acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And is there a position on the board for either? Well, we have, yeah, I mean, I think we're really lucky with the two non execs we have, in truth. I think a company of our size to have the quality of non execs, it, you know, is, we're, we're very, very fortunate. And they both have quite different kill, skill sets, I hope they'll excuse me for saying that, which complement us as a board very well. In Bill, we have sort of hard bitten operator of businesses, and, you know, he keeps our toes to the fire on operational stuff, has a roller deck to die for, in truth. And so Bill's extra consultancy has been very much around sales and business development and customer development. And he's done a lot in terms of coaching some of our staff too. So that's, that explains Bill. Bill has a very small shareholding, but I think anybody who knows him will say he's, he's fiercely independent. <laughs> Keith? Keith was a senior um, partner at Price Waterhouse and doing, running the consultancy business at one stage, deeply involved in all sorts of major M&A stuff. And when we have an acquisition, we have two choices. We can either go to a PwC with somebody who probably is 15 and hasn't left school yet uh, and pay a fortune to get it done, or we can pay an absolute expert <laughs> to go and do it who will, you know, 
get to the heart of the matter so much more effectively. And we, we've just chosen to use Keith to do that. The bank's been very happy with that. You know, it's, it's, it's been very effective for us. Keith has no shares in the company and is completely independent from that perspective. And again, I think it would be, it would be a mistake to suggest that because Keith has helped us do the DD, that that in any way colours his opinion of, of how well we run the business after we've completed the deal, which in the end is, you know, the non-execs are there to help us with strategy and, and keep us to account. In terms of the uh, capitalised development costs, um, under the accounting rules, we don't actually have a choice. So the fact that we're investing so much in products that are going to be generating revenue in future years, under the accounting rules, we have to capitalise them. And, and the million pounds that we wrote off uh, was associated with costs which wasn't going to generate revenue in future years. Did I see any other hands up? Just a minute. Yes, yes. yes. could you talk a little bit about remote uh, engine diagnostics? Uh, I think last year you talked about uh, anticipating battery failure and so on, and that's uh, very useful for fleet managers. What's been happening in the last 12 months on that front? Okay, well, you, you know that some of our background is from a, an automotive diagnostics, and so when we used to do automotive diagnostics in our old days, it was very much around understanding in depth as many of the ECUs on a vehicle as we could. So we'd, we'd beaver away and we'd become really, really expert on all the BMW systems so that our BMW application was, was really wonderful and, and we could fix BMWs of every sort and type and every ECU in the aftermarket. Telematics is a slightly different strategy because what we want to have is Whatever we do, we want to be able to do for every car that has that data available at the diagnostic socket. And, and I've used those words quite carefully because car companies vary in the data they make available at the diagnostic socket. And so when I say to you that we know the service, we know where the car is and its service timeline for every car on the road, that actually is a qualification, needs qualification because actually not every car company knows what it is and has got it within their ECU algorithms. So for every car company that actually within their ECU stores when the car needs to be serviced next, we know that. For every car company, you know what the real ODO is on the, on the gauge. For every car company now, we know, and I mean every car, from every car company, we now know uh, what the fuel level is in the fuel tank. And you can think of all the reasons why those have been the first things that we've, we've worried about. Because you think the opportunity with lease car companies and rental car companies, those are the things that they're most focused on. The battery algorithm came about because actually it is the number one cause of breakdown for all the roadside assistance companies. So if we can, if we can reduce the incidence of them being called out for that, then that reduces their operating costs. And frankly, the customer's probably a lot happier to be told before he breaks down than when he has. And that's the, that's the journey of travel. We have an increasing number of systems that we're going to cover on every single car that will make that data available at the diagnostic socket. And, you know, we've got a next hit list of four or five that we're working on today. I'm not sharing it with you now, but it's, this is part of the journey. And, and so with time, we'll add more and more prognostics value based on systems rather than on vehicle types. Sorry, you go on. Very quickly, could you just give us a little bit of colour? You've not talked a lot about the AA deal and the BT fleet deal. Could you just give us a little bit of colour of how that's going and where you see it you know, in 12 minutes' time, what you're going to be telling us uh, the successes of that? When you, when you work with partners, it very much depends on the, how the partner does as well as how we do. Um, you know, we have in the room the man who's working full-time with the AA to help them build, you know, build a business in what they call AA fleet intelligence. Um, we've won customers, nothing big enough and spectacular enough to, to justify an announcement. And I think it's going to be one of those things that probably takes a bit of time. You know, uh, those, those relationships, they're third, you know, they're second hand if you like, and so we have to work with the, the, the all the different marketing and, and, and sales people at the AA to to get them to help us make them successful. And that's, you know, that's pretty much what we're trying to do. This time next year, will I be able to tell you whether it's you know, 2,000 units or 20,000 units? I can't tell you that. I don't know. 
Um, BT Fleet is a slightly different kettle of fish. They, um, we've, we've already got units installed um, through customers of theirs. So that's, you know, that's quite quick. And we have lots of opportunity with the whole of the, the BT group. They have a lot of vehicles that they manage themselves directly and so have a much closer connection to the sale of telematics. We have common customers already, E.ON, EDF, um, well, yeah, yeah. So, so if, I, if I was a betting man, I think we'll get traction with BT fleet slightly quicker than the AA. Right, thank you very much, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you.